I don't know. If they're scared to walk outside, if they're, if they're, if they're, if they're, if they're afraid of the terror by night and the, and the terror by day, I don't know. The Bible tells me he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I'll tell you where I'm going to live. Amen. A thousand can fall at one side, 10,000 daily at the other side, but it's not coming nigh me nor my brother. Glory to God. I believe that he's able to keep that which I committed to him against that day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you would this month, excuse me, be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew the 26th chapter. I mean, excuse me, Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Rusty. My bad. I think I told him 26 earlier. Glory to God. How many understand this morning? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. I'm not talking about everything that's going on. I'm talking about how you deal with everything that's going on. It's all about Jesus. If you make it about you, then you're going to struggle more than you have to. Matthew 24, I'm just going to begin reading as you turn there. Verse 3, And as Jesus said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that ye not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in different places, and all these things are the beginning of sorrows. <clears throat> then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall uh, hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. It's interesting here that word love. That word love in the Greek is uh, agape. Now, the, that's the God kind of love. The only people who operate in the God kind of love, Rusty, are Christians. So the verse says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many, who's he talking to? Believers. That's agape. Unbelievers don't have agape. They can receive agape. Don't understand. But because iniquity shall abound, the love of many, talking about believers, shall wax cold. But he that endureth uh, to the end, the same shall be saved. Verse 14, friends. And this gospel, somebody say gospel. Uh -huh. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom. Woo! The gospel. The gospel. I mean, of this gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom starts at the cross. Man. Glory to God. It starts at the cross. The cross is the cornerstone of our faith. There is no Christianity apart from the cross. Uh, this gospel of the kingdom, apart from the, the death, burial, and resurrection, uh, there is no gospel good news, friend. Uh, it, it all starts at the cross. We need to get this deeply uh, implanted in ourselves that, that our message to others be birthed out of, out of that revelation, amen? That first and foremost, the gospel, the gospel of this kingdom is what, is what Jesus has done for you. That Jesus died for your sins. He paid the price for your sins. Uh, and now, because of what Jesus did, God and man can be reconciled, can come together. Can you say amen? Because of what Jesus did. That first and foremost, let's get, just get this straight as we start. The message of the cross is love. John 3, 16, say it with me. For God so loved. He did what? So love. I think about that. There's a lot of things I love, but I don't know how many things I so love. He so love. so love the world. Not just church people. Why? He so loved the world, say with me. That whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Glory to God. The message of the cross is love. The gospel is love. 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here's love. Not that we love God. Glory to God. That's the God kind of love. 
That's not like the love that the, 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 the young dude had who wrote the letter to his uh, uh, fiance, to his girlfriend, uh, you know, of a long time. Said, "Sweetheart, if the world was as hot as the Sahara Desert, I would crawl across." Oh, if, if it was as the Atlantic Ocean and those shark-infested waters were just foaming, I would, I would swim the seas to get to you. If it was the most fiercest dragon ever known were, were standing between me and you, I would, I would fight him to be by your side. I'll see you Thursday if it doesn't rain. <laughs> Come on, not like that kind of love. God's kind of love. Christ-like love. Our job as Christians is to be Christ-like. You understand that, that this body of Christ, the body of Christ, is supposed to be like the original body of Christ. Also, this body of Christ corporately is supposed to operate in this earth, do the same body things, do, act like, treat people like the original body did when he walked the earth. We are to love like him. Somebody say all people. We are to serve like him. And then not just here, definitely here, but everywhere. Jesus said, I come to serve. One preacher said it like this. He said, Jesus came to be used. Some people get bothered by a statement like that. Jesus came to be used. We don't like being used, using somebody. Man, God wants you to use him. He, he wants to be your source. He wants you to look to him for all your needs. Can you say amen? He wants you to take from him. You understand that God wants, you can't take something from God he doesn't want you to have. He wants you to take from him. Second Peter 1.3, uh, he has given unto us all things pertaining to life and godliness uh, through the knowledge of him who has called us uh, by, by glory and virtue that by these exceedingly great and precious promises we might be a partaker of his divine nature. He wants to give to us, amen. He wants us to know glory to God. Let me tell you, friend, it is only in knowing that God promises uh, what you are seeking that all uncertainty can be removed that is yours. I say it's only in you knowing that what you're seeking, God says you can have. Then all uncertainty is removed. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Friend, what God's offering you is more than you can't get anywhere else. Hallelujah. Peace, freedom, deliverance, life. I know many, many things promised, but none have delivered. Good morning. Jesus said, uh, the words I speak, uh, they are spirit and life. Uh, he said, this word will set you free. John, John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I want to talk about the gospel this morning. Amen. The good news. The, that knowledge of Christ. If you would be turning to Luke chapter 7. Hallelujah. If the Bible says that we have been given all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, through knowing him, we need to know him. We need to know him. We need to understand some things. Glory to God. We've got to start somewhere. It's like the guy who was uh, traveling cross country with his wife and came up to a town they'd never been to before. And he asked all the time, and he's sitting on downtown bench. He said, were any famous people born here? He said, no, just famous. Just famous. I understand we're all born famous. Whether physically, spiritually, we've got to grow. We've got to grow. But we start off as a baby. It doesn't matter how old you are when it comes to spiritual things. You start off as a baby, okay? One of the wonderful things uh, or aspects about a baby is they have no past. A baby has no past. In other words, a baby has no bad memories of what happened to them that they're carrying along with them, okay? The babies aren't holding grudges and, and are, are, are having an offense about something that happened uh, last year or last week or 30 minutes ago, okay? Baby's not... Still crying over something that happened 10 minutes ago. Y'all know we know the verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, anybody here in Christ? Any man, any woman be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Glory to God. When you become born again, you're not who you were when you took your first step. Glory to God. And as I walk with the Lord, I, I like the songwriter said one time, and I'm, and I'm convinced that he's not finished with me yet. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I think we all need to meditate on that verse a little bit uh, more in the body of Christ. Let, 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 behold, all things, have, all things have passed away. I'm new. Let the truth of that deal with some of the baggage that we try to bring into our new life. Amen. That we try to bring into this new Christian walk. Okay, so with that in mind, Luke chapter 7 
we find a wonderful, a wonderful account here. Luke chapter 7, verse uh, 36. And one of the Pharisees desired Jesus that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And she stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bid him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, Huh, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him. Jesus said. And Jesus answered and said unto him, I love <laughs> This guy in the Bible just said he said this in his own heart. He didn't even say it out loud, but Jesus heard. <laughs> Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he, to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house. Thou gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman says the time I came in has not stopped kissing my feet. My head with oil you didn't anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore, I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they, said, and they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? In verse 50, and he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Go in peace. Glory to God. Let me tell you something. This story, we're talking about the gospel, the gospel of this kingdom, Matthew 24 told us. This story is a picture of the gospel. As a matter of fact, uh, this woman came to Jesus. We find the same story in Matthew 26. We find it in Mark 15, uh, Mark 14, here in Luke 7. And of all the women, as a matter of fact, of all the people that, that, that the Bible you know, references to, uh, tells stories of, hers is all over the place. And Jesus said this in uh, Matthew 26, 43. He said, wherever the gospel, somebody said the gospel, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, this shall be also what this woman did as a memorial to her. He said the same thing over in the book of Mark, chapter 14. Why? Why would Jesus say that wherever the gospel is preached, this, this is going to be a reminder? Because this is a picture of the gospel, friend. What's taking place in this, in this account is the gospel in action. It exemplifies the gospel. This is the effect that the gospel should have on a person's life right here. Glory to God. Look at verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus was at that Pharisee's house, when she knew that he was there, in other words, she was a pursuer of Jesus. She was a pursuer. She was looking for him. She wanted to meet him. Uh, I, I'm sure she understood uh, the social protocol of the day, okay? That you just don't walk into somebody's house uninvited. That, 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 that's not really acceptable. But she was desperate for Jesus. She wanted to have an encounter with Jesus, enough to bypass all the protocol, okay? Come to the Pharisee's house, amen? And, and sh that, that's, the, that's the preacher. Surely a sinner's not going to do that, but yet she did. This woman, the sinner the Bible calls her, is at the Pharisee's house because she heard Jesus was there. She heard the Lord was there. Now, I don't, I'm just talking right now. I don't know what she knew about Jesus. Maybe she had heard him talk about the love of God before. Maybe she had heard Jesus walking around talking about God and calling him Father. Talking about a compassionate, a loving, kind, Father, merciful. How I many know that's attractive talk if you've got problems in life? That's, if you're hurting, that's the type of language you want to hear when it comes to describing God. That's not what the preachers were preaching back in Luke chapter 7. That's not what the Pharisees were saying. They told of a demanding God. 
okay? Instead of just the law of God, which is all religion ever seems to point out, the do's and the don'ts. Maybe she heard about the love of God, that stuff that Jesus was teaching, that stuff about how God loved people with issues. How God loved people who were lost. I mean, come on, sure. We, we ought to understand by now, when it comes to the law, the, those, those, the, the, the very purpose of the law was to point all of us to Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Its very purpose wasn't to save you, wasn't that you could be good enough to make it to heaven. It was to show you that you are not good enough. It was to show you that you can't make it to heaven in and of yourself. That you can't be right with God. No matter how good or how hard you try, you will blow it somewhere. What the law did and what the law still does, it makes it very clear that you are disqualified in and of yourself. You can't make God in and of yourself. You have to have Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I wonder why so many folks still insist on the law's demand instead of Jesus' grace. Some preaching, I, I listen to a lot of preaching, and some preaching, it seems to me, is it's Jesus and the law. And it's just kind of mixed together. It's, it's both. What? It's like, you need Jesus to be saved, but you need the law to stay saved. It's kind of a mixture of both. No, it's Jesus only. Amen or oh me. I said it's Jesus only. That's what makes you right with God. See, people and churches and well, they're still using the law to disqualify folk, okay? You're not right with God. You can't be right with God. And they don't realize that it's disqualifying them too. Know what I mean? They don't realize that what they're saying is disqualifying them too. Because the law tells us that if you stumble at one point, if you did everything right but missed it in one place, guilty. The Bible says it's a schoolmaster pointing us to Jesus. Your trust this morning should be in nothing, nothing other than Jesus. Maybe this woman heard uh, Jesus tell the, the, the Pharisees, the religious people, that even the prostitutes and the tax collectors were getting in heaven ahead of them based on what they were teaching. Maybe she heard him say that. I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe she heard him say, hey, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Maybe she was tired. Maybe she was hurting, and she wanted some rest because nobody else was offering her any rest. Maybe she heard the Lord speak about that. Maybe she thought, is it possible? Is it possible? Could I be a part? Did he mean, could I be free? Free of what society is saying about me? Free of the guilt that they're pointing at me? Free of the guilt that I'm laying on my own self? Could it be? I must find out. So she finds Jesus. She wanted an encounter. Church, we, we need to catch this right here. She wanted an encounter with God, so she sought him out. You know, we're always trying to make people, it seems like, come to church. You know what? People need to see their need for Christ themselves. We're always trying to make somebody do something. People need to see their need their self. That's what bears results. Okay? That's what the gospel, that's, that's the true gospel. That's the gospel. When the gospel shows you your need for Jesus. Okay? Your need. She came prepared. I, I like. She came prepared to give everything that she had. The Bible tells us she had this box, this alabaster box, and it, it was an expensive jewelry. It was an expensive item, and inside that expensive item was was an equally expensive ointment, a perfume, a spikenard, or whatever you want to call it. This morning, Mark chapter fourteen tells us the same story, and it says that what this alabaster box she had was worth more than three hundred denarii. Now, a denarii, those who study such things tell me, you know, when I, when I research, they tell me that one denarii was equal to one day's wages. Okay? One day of work. And what she had was worth 300 of them. Now, think about this. 300 days of work. Maybe, maybe 52 Sabbath days in a year. Throw in a few feast days. You're up to 300. You're up to one whole year is what it costs for this, this item that she had. 300 days of work, some Sabbath where you couldn't work, throw in the spring, like I said, sprinkle in some feast days. That's a whole year. A whole year was the price of this, of this, of this extravagant offering that she had. Did Jesus refuse it? That's interesting. 
Did Jesus refuse all that she had to give? No. Jesus had a revelation about God. He knew there was no better ground with your seed. Come on, somebody. There's no better, more fertile uh, place to, 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 to give your all. See, sometimes we think we know better. We think, well, oh, you shouldn't do that. Yeah, you know better. You know better than the word. <laughs> she gave everything she had. Look at me, church. That's not up there. <laughs> not up there, son. She gave everything she had. This is what we're talking about this morning. That's the gospel. What's the gospel? Everything you got. Giving everything you got. I'm not talking about just money. I'm talking about your life. That's the gospel. Wherever the gospel's told, he said, you can look to this woman and her example, and you can see a picture of it. Here's a woman who gave everything she had for Jesus. Glory to God. That's the gospel. Can I tell you this morning? God wants you. Look to your neighbor and say, you. Come on, look at one at him. One at one at You, God wants you. Not just your sin. Not just your problems. You. You are his objection, objective. And to get to his objective, he deals with your sin issue. He deals with all the other problems he got. Not that you got. Not that he wants them. Not that God's a sin collector. He throws it as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says. He throws it in the sea of unforgetfulness. He's not a collector of sin. He's a lover of men. His objective of dealing with sin in the first place is to get to you. Ooh. I mean, I guess if he collected sin, he'd have the world's finest collection. But he has no use for sin. He wants man. He wants man. Our way, man's way, well, yeah, we want him to clean us up. Give us our reservation in heaven and so that we can live our cleaned up life down here on earth just however we want to. Right. <laughs> oh, we might do some here or some there for the gospel, but for the most part, we haven't given God all. We may do a, you know, some here, some there, some more than others, some less than others, but have we given him all? I think that should answer a lot of questions you may have as to why perhaps you're not walking in all the blessings and all the promises that the Bible holds forth for those who love Him. It's not short, short, shortcoming on His end. The problem's always on man's end. Why you? Maybe maybe, maybe that will answer uh, a question or two of perhaps why you're not walking in peace and joy like the Bible talks about. If you're still the Lord of your life, ultimately, meaning you're the one who makes all the say sos then it's your responsibility to provide peace and joy for your life. How's that working for you? I mean, don't get me wrong. A gospel that's all about me, that, that's, that's pretty, that sounds pretty good to the flesh. So I understand one's great frustration when it doesn't work out for you well. See, that's not the true gospel. The true gospel, there's God's side and there's man's side. That's the true gospel, Titus 2.14. God gave himself for us that he might redeem us and purify unto himself a, a peculiar people zealous for good works. In other words, he did all the work that we might choose him. God's side and your side. He did everything, but you've got a choice. Oh, friend, the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart is. She came Prepared. Not only did she find out where Jesus was, she showed up with what she had. She showed up with everything. She came prepared to give all. Are you prepared today to give God everything? Is there something in your life that you're withholding? That's not the gospel. The gospel is all. Amen. Amen. He's worthy of everything, isn't he? Yes. Is he? Yes. Do, you, do you believe that? Yes. Don't hold back. Can I ask you this morning, if you were as devoted to your job as you are to Jesus, would you still have a job? If you were as faithful to your wife or husband as you are to Jesus, would you still be married? If you paid your bills like you pay your tithe, would you have food? Would you have a car? Would you have a house to live in? Come on, somebody. If you were obedient to the sec if you were as obedient to the secular law as you are to God's word, would you be free or would you be locked up today? She didn't hold back that which was most precious to her. She willingly poured it out for him. Now look at verse 38. And stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet. Come on, somebody. 
brokenness, humility, stood behind him, stood at his feet, didn't walk in wanting the limelight, everybody look at me. She wasn't concerned about being the center of attention. I, I would like to think that she had her way. Nobody would even notice her. Okay? See, that's where a lot of people miss it right there. They make everything about them. Good or bad. If good things are happening to them, look at me, look at me, give it me. If bad things are happening to them, look at me, look at me, look at me. They make everything about themselves. I believe that the gospel has taken root in your life. It will produce, it should produce a level of humility. Jesus said this, he said, take my yoke and learn of me. I'm meek, I'm, I'm lowly, I came to serve. Okay? You reckon that's why sinners flocked to Jesus? I mean, they came from everywhere. He was friendly. He wasn't standoffish. Jesus didn't act elite untouchable. And if we're to be like him, there should be some humility operating in our own lives. Come on, somebody. Hey, this is, this is God. This is about God, not about uh, Tommy standing up here at, 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 the, at the pulpit. Remember what Peter and John said in Acts chapter 3? He said, he, they said, guys, don't look at us as if we by some power of our own caused this man to walk. It's Jesus who did this. She stood behind him. This wasn't about her, okay? You know, when we testify, make sure your testimony is about the Lord and not about you. Not about, not about what all you've done, this done, that done, and, and then throw in a and praise God at the end. You no, know, when we testify, we're test the testimony that overcomes the, the, the devil in your life, the testimony that overcomes the world is you testify about what he's done in your life and do it in your life. Can you make Jesus the center of attention in your life? Or do you have to be? Can he be the focus of everything? Not just to mention, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I go to church. She's broken. She's weeping. Maybe she's, maybe I don't know if she's under conviction and, and she's remorse, regret. I, I don't know, sorrow. When's the last time you shed a few tears of repentance over something you said or something you did or something you didn't say or something you didn't do because you felt like How many knows 1 John 1 in his body in his life? We'll see life. In other words, when we really see him, then we can really begin to see ourselves. See, you, you really cannot get a proper perspective of your own self without seeing him. That's why the Bible says his word is like a mirror. And you look into it, and you can see yourself for who you really are. And he goes on to say, the problem is, a lot of people, as soon as they leave, they forget what they saw. You know? I'm not talking about who you're masquerading as. I'm not talking about the parade that you're marching down the middle of town there for everybody looking. I'm talking about the inside. And she does, and she breaks. I think of Peter. Remember Peter in Luke chapter 5? Been fishing all night, didn't catch anything. Jesus gets in the boat with him, uh, Miss Pardon, and they, and they go out and they, and, he, and, and they catch so many fish. And the next thing Peter looks at the master and says, Master, leave me, I'm a sinful man. And his life was too light. Is Jesus going to leave him? No, he's the reason Jesus was in the boat. Come on, somebody. Church, when you realize. I was created by God and created for God. And there came a time in my life when I realized, yet I've done most everything contrary to God. Yeah. Created by and for, but yet just about everything I did has been against by default. I mean, I wasn't purposely going out, you know, all against, but by default, I was. It should cause you to break. I said, sure. That's what happens here. Tears of remorse. Glory to God, but they don't stay that way. They turn to tears of joy. Verse 48, Jesus says, There seems to be this. Thank you, Lord. How many knows if he said that to her, he'll say that to you. Though her sins be many, he said earlier. He knew who he was talking to, somebody. 
He's not a respecter of persons. If he forgave her, he'll forgive me. Glory to God. Jesus accepts her. He'll accept you today. Glory to God. If you'll cry out to him this morning. The Bible says a broken and a contrite heart God cannot refuse. He resists the proud. I got it. Not me. I ain't got nothing. Nothing wrong with me. He resists that. But he gives grace to the home. Lord, help me. I need help. Lord, I'm blowing it left and right. I don't know what I'm doing here. He gives grace to that person. She needed the grace of God. How many believe we need the grace of God? The grace that transforms us. The grace that's greater than all of our sin. Not like, come on, church. I know what people say. I, I, I listen to, uh, like I said, I listen to a lot of preaching. And some of it is just, some of it is just wrong. Some of it's really good. A lot of it's really good. Some of it's just wrong. I hear things about grace. and I'm not talking about a grace that permits you to continue in sin. But a grace that empowers you to break sin's grip. Okay? Not freedom to sin, but freedom from sin. Can you say amen? amen? Don't fool yourself. It's not, grace isn't you're free to do, because really that, that means you're in bondage too, if that's the way you think. If you think I'm free to do, you're deceived. You're in bondage too. You're just wanting, and you're just wanting that stuff. That's the mindset that has. Paul said this. He said, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. In other words, grace is strong. It's as simple as that. Not weaker, but stronger. It's able to break sin's power over your life. But that grace only comes as we humble ourselves. He gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. She humbles herself. She's washing his feet with her hair. Kissing his feet, drying, uh, washing his feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. Kissing his feet with the lips of her mouth, friend. She's ministering to the Lord. Willingly serving the Lord. Oh, she came into the house, I think, and she realized there was a need. And she took care of it. When was the last time you walked in and you realized there was a need? You ask, is there something that you can do for that? Or you can just ignore it and let somebody else can tell you to do something about it. Come on, somebody. She realized there was a need that hadn't been met, that, that, that Jesus' feet hadn't been washed. She didn't look for somebody else. To, we need somebody over here. Take care of this. She did it herself. Matter of fact, obviously that's a job nobody really wants to do. I mean, back in these times, it was slaves who did that. Okay? She saw a need, takes on the role of a servant. That's the gospel. I said, that's the gospel. Reminds me of somebody else who washed some feet over in John. Matter of fact, hold your spot. Turn around and put the John 13. John 13. I remember this story right here. I'm going to read when you turn there. It says, verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Look at verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God, and went to God. In other words, he knew exactly who he was. Okay? Look at verse 4. He rises from supper, Laid aside his garments, took a towel and put it himself. The master. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was good. Glory to God. Jesus knew exactly who he was, that he was God Almighty. Yet he humbled himself. Glory to God. He humbled himself. Took on the role of a servant. He took off that which was on him and girded himself up with a towel and began to serve. Oh, church. Can we be disciplined enough to love all kinds of people? Not just those who are like us. Not just those who are in our circle or our clique, whatever you want to call it. Can we be disciplined enough to serve all? Towel and wash feet. 
He who would be the greatest serves them all. That's what she does back here in Luke 7. Luke 7, verse 50, if you'll flip back. He said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. She came in faith. Somebody say faith. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. She came serving, worshiping, giving all that she had. That, that was the evidence of her faith, amen. She believed he was the answer. Church, faith is the answer. Faith is the trigger that activates everything, friend. Hebrews eleven six. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That's faith. Faith says, God, I believe you can, you, you're able, and you will. Real faith. Real faith takes of his fullness. Real faith takes from God. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Real faith doesn't walk with, with some false humility. It walks in real humility and it receives from God what? Everything that he needs. Unless you receive the kingdom as a little child, Jesus said. Was a little, I, I, you, know, you know what I know about little children? They need everything. They take everything from their parents. Come on, somebody. I mean, when's the last time you dressed, you, you, the alarm clock went off and your two-year-old got up, got dressed, and went out to work? No. Alarm clock finally went off and then he started hollering wanting you to come feed him or change a diaper or something. <laughs> she worshipped him. That bothered old Simon, the preacher. Bothered me. I mean, there's passion makes religion uncomfortable. <laughs> you get all passionate about the things of God and religious folk, and they don't like that. Why has it got to be all that? That's how much I need. Glory to God. You know, I used to smoke dope. Smoked a lot of dope. Why? Because that's how much I needed to get to where I was going. <laughs> Some people, I smoke dope for some people, and we just get started good, and they laid out. <laughs> they didn't need that much. I needed more. You don't know how much I need. You don't know how much I need. Don't be judging me by my passion. Don't be judging others by how they're dependent. You don't know what it takes for them. Come on, somebody. What does Simon say, verse 39? When the Pharisee which called him saw it. He said within himself, he just thought this. Huh. This man were a prophet. He didn't know who and what man or woman this is. Touching him. I knew it. I knew he was a prophet. She's a sinner. He ain't a man of God. I knew it. He just <laughs> reads his mails and says, Simon, let me ask you something. He loves the most. She had been forgiven for a lot, so she loved a lot. Those who feel like they've got their act all together, those who feel like basically, I'm talking about people in church now, those who feel like basically they've really got everything together, they just need to just a little something from Jesus. Just a, you know, just a, little, a little around the edge, not much, not much. I'm basically all together. Well, Jesus said they, don't, they love women. They don't see their need. Jesus knew who she was. Verse 47, he said, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many. <laughs> he knew who he was. He knew. She didn't fool him. Oh, here's just somebody who loves me, just walked in. You know. No, he knew exactly who had walked in. A big time sinner. She had lots of issues, okay? He knew who she was. Just like when he, when he said in John chapter 4, I must needs go through, go through Samaria. I got an appointment up there for the woman at a well. Y'all remember that woman? She had issues too. You know what I'm saying? But Jesus said, I've got to go there. He knew who he was dealing with, but because she humbled herself, friend. This lady humbled herself, repented. He, he, didn't, he didn't hold that against her. Come on, somebody. He didn't, even, he didn't even mention it anymore. He didn't mention all, all her issues. Friend, let me tell you something this morning, and hear me well. He won't mention your sins to you if you don't mention them to him. In other words, if you'll confess your sins, he's faithful to, uh, to forgive you your sins. But if you don't think you need to bother to mention them, 
then he'll bring them up to you. Yeah. One day. But if you'll mention them, then if you'll, if you'll tell him about them first, he'll never mention them again. My God. This woman couldn't stop kissing him. I mean, how many know you only kiss those who love? That's the gospel. He's more valuable than anything. Amen. Anything else. Do you love Jesus this morning, friend? Does your life show that you love Jesus? Does your actions prove that you love Jesus? Are the, are the choices you make based on a love for Jesus? Would others testify about you that that man, that woman loves the Lord? You know, I, I, when I go to funeral homes uh, where someone passes away and, and, and I listen to what people are saying or I go and meet their families and, and, and you know, try to find out a little something about the person, it's not hard to tell what the, the deceased loved. Okay? You just listen to their friends and their family. Boy, he sure loved the Crimson Tide. Boy, he loved Alan. That. <laughs> you just listen, you'll find out what people love. He, she loved to cook. Mm, she loved to cook. Shopping was her life. I mean, you know what I'm saying? He loved to, I mean, I go on and on. You just listen. He loved, but but she she sure loved her. You know what? I hope that if, if I were, if I, if I were to leave this earth before y'all do, don't count on it. <laughs> if I leave this earth, I'm like, we all going together, amen. Right, I don't care where y'all preach it. So, uh, I see y'all, you know, and catch up. <laughs> if we all leave together, you know, the Bible says we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye, amen. And we'll all see that at the coming of the Lord. It doesn't, it doesn't say, Mark, it doesn't say we're going to all just jump up into heaven that fast. It just says we're going to be changed fast. I believe I'm going to change, wham, just like that. Then I'm moving for a slow rise. And let everybody see me. <laughs> hey, he is going. <laughs> Told you. No. I hope not. I hope somebody would say he sure loved Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Church, do you love Jesus? I can't answer that for you. You have to answer that for yourself. He's looking on the heart this morning and speaking to your heart today. Loving Jesus with all. You know what that is? All. Oh, that's the gospel. Give me two minutes. John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, and no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Very, very, or truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. He cannot see, or he cannot perceive the kingdom of God living in the church. You want to know what's the gospel? You must be born again. You can't get around that. Folks would like to get around that. Shoot, they may, maybe back in the, I would like to have got around it myself back then. You can't get around it. You must be born again. That's the gospel. The recognition, okay, that I'm a sinner, that I have a need for a savior that I can't change on my own, that there's no good thing in me that can save me in and of myself. Perhaps that's one of the hardest things for a person to admit, is that they're a sinner, that they need something that they can't do for themselves. How many men, men we got in here? Yeah. Or, 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 or maybe a woman who's having to take care of things and you do what you've got to do. Hard to admit that, you can't, that there's something that you need that you can't do for yourself. Of course, the religious mindset is all you ever are is a sinner. That's not right. I'm talking, I'm talking about after you get saved, religious mindset tell you that you're still a sinner. I mean, I say to you, if you're sinning, stop. I'm born again. Not what I was going to say. For love. Accept it. Code it. But prior to salvation, one must, one, one must acknowledge they're a sinner. No cover-ups, no pretending. That's where the gospel starts with you. Amen. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and all show the glory of God. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there's none righteous. No, not even one. Not even you. Not even sweet, sweet, sweet aunt such and such. He was, if anybody was a Christian, she was. Well, apart from Jesus, she wasn't righteous at all. Once a person realizes that they're a sinner, then you must come to the only one who can say, Jesus. 
Come to the only one who can help the Lord Jesus, the Savior of the world. Not Dr. Phil, not the view, not the real, not anything else, not the preacher. There's only one way. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Only one way, one truth, one life, only one person who's ever paid the price for sin. You must come to the only one who can set you free. Maybe you've tried religion before. Maybe you're watching by the internet before. Today, you tried religion before, only to be rejected. Maybe you tried church and they found out who you were and they told you to leave. I don't know. Church, let me close with this. We're to love people. That's the gospel. What our country needs today is the gospel. A little more love going around. That's the gospel. We're to love people. You say amen. It's not here. Y'all stand up. Hallelujah. Somebody say the Lord is good. The Lord is so good. He, he can't be any other way. That's just who he is. He's good to you this morning. He's good to me. I look around and I see y'all guys and I think, gosh, the Lord is good. God's good. He's good. If you're here today and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm talking about what we've been talking about today, the gospel, where he means everything to you. But there's nothing in between you and him. There's a value in the relationship you have with the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. Being born in him. Having it. Ask Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. Amen. Not just your reservation taker for heaven, but the one who's going to guide you through this earth. Are you born again? If you need Jesus, I'd love to pray with you. If you're watching by the internet today, why don't everybody here, let's just bow our heads and let's just say this prayer again. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, be, Jesus. be my Lord. Be my Lord. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It didn't say whosoever shall jump through 40 hoops. Huh? Be the best this, the best that, the sorriest this, the sorriest that. No, it just says whoever will call on Jesus. Out of a, out of a pure, out of a heart, that means it. That's, that's the best way I can put it in, in just regular language. Tell me better than out of a heart that means it. You said that today, you prayed that today, and you meant it from your heart. God's for you. He's not against you. He loves you with an everlasting love. Amen. Hallelujah. He's not mad. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, just give him more praise. He's good. Amen. He's good. Amen. Oh, thank you for the Hallelujah. We're going to dismiss. We're going to confess a good confession today. Amen. As we do that, if I can pray with you, I would invite you to come up to the front and I'll just pray with you. If you want to come up to the front and just uh, uh, deal with, talk to the Lord with yourself over there, well, the altars are open. Uh, we got time. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you today for that. Say this with me. I'm strong in the Lord. I am more than a conqueror. I am blessed to heal by the strength of Jesus. I have the greater one living in me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am a child of God.